Welcome to the Art Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm Rachel Dempsey. I'll be your host for today's RN Supply Chain Meetup. I'm joined by my colleague and co-host for today, Curtis Kephart. If you want to say hello as well, Curtis. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and we're also joined by our two awesome speakers for today, Laura Darby Rose and Ralph Asher. If you just join now, feel free to introduce yourselves through the chat window as well and say hello, maybe include where you're calling in from. But just to go through a brief agenda while we wait for a few others from the waiting room, we'll go through some introductions of the meetup, um, have two awesome presentations, intro to supply chain design with Ralph Asher and forecasting demand with R with Laura Rhodes. We'd like to also use today's meetup to kick off a supply chain working group too. Um, and Curtis Kephart from our team will give us uh, some more information on that and how to join if this is something that's interesting to you. And then lastly, we'll open it up for additional audience Q&A and just open discussion among everyone. I did mute everybody upon entry right now, but at, towards the end, we will unmute. Um, but if you do have questions, during any of the presentations, we do have a Slido link that you can use. Um, so you can ask anonymously or include your name there as well. And we'll share that in the Zoom window right now. That will really help us to organize questions too and you can upvote people's questions. And just a quick note that the recording will be shared up to the RStudio YouTube as well. So if you wanna share it with anyone or go back and listen later, um, that will be shared up there. One other housekeeping note, if you want to turn on live transcription during the meeting, you can do so as well. And that's offered in the Zoom bar below. And Curtis, if you could go to the next uh, slide. Awesome. For anyone who's joining for the first time today, I'd love to welcome you to this meetup group. This is a friendly and open meetup environment for teams to share the work that they're doing within their organizations, teach lessons learned, network with others, and really just allow us all to learn from each other. So thank you all for making this a welcoming community. I really want to create a space where everybody can participate and we can hear from everyone. So we wanna reiterate that we love to hear from everyone, no matter your level of experience in the field as well. So if you ever have suggestions or general feedback, or want to speak at a future meetup, I'll share a few links in the chat window right after this as well. Um, but with all of that, I would love to introduce our first speaker today, Ralph Asher. So Ralph is the founder of Data Driven Supply Chain. And prior to founding Data Driven Supply Chain, Ralph worked as an operations research scientist in corporate supply chain functions at Target and General Mills. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Ralph. All right, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Uh, hello to everyone who's on this webinar, wherever you may be, uh, just reading through the chat. Sounds like we have a, a global presence already, and that's great. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ralph Asher, and today I'll be talking about supply chain network design. Uh, what is it, first off, uh, and how can we use open source languages like R and Python to design supply chains? So I will share my screen, and hopefully uh, this will go off without a hitch. All right, so a little about myself, uh, like many on this call, I have a uh, math and science background. I have a bachelor's in physics and, uh, and a master's in operations research. Uh, I started my career uh, after college in the military. I was on active duty in the Marine Corps for several years uh, and I've been serving as a reserve, uh, reserve Marine in a part-time capacity for about 10 years since then. Uh, after military, I worked in supply chain design and simulation for eight years at General Mills and Target here in uh, beautiful cold Minneapolis, Minnesota. I left the uh, corporate world last summer to found my own consulting firm. Uh, if you're interested in more, learn more about that, please reach out. Uh, in addition to running my company and serving in the Marine Reserve, I'm also an adjunct at the, at the University of Minnesota Business School, uh, where I teach statistics. Um, I've been an R user for 10 years, uh, since 2012, and I've really found the language to be an ever uh, increasingly versatile uh, tool for my work. I've also loved maps and math and programming since I was a little kid, so I'm, I'm kind of fortunate that I've found a career field that lets me merge these interests. 
So supply chains from the back office to the front page. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's, it's really caused unprecedented disruption uh, to global supply chains. Manufacturing shutdowns as well as labor shortages and, and a dramatic shift in consumer spending from services to goods have caused massive disruptions to the previously invisible flow of materials. Uh, this disruption can be seen in the container ships waiting off the coast of Southern California, awaiting to dock in Los Angeles and Long Beach. It can be seen in the reconsideration of reshoring American manufacturing capacity or the delays in building and repairing homes due to supply shortages. It can be seen in the inflation that you see at the store shelves and at the gas pump. Uh, and even Santa Claus can't fix these problems. And he has the most advanced logistics operation known to mankind or elf kind. Instead, the task of ensuring supply chains continue to function so we literally have food on our plate and fuel in our cars. That falls to the legions of hardworking supply chain management professionals. And as a data scientist, I'm really quite proud to be able to use my quantitative and technical skills to help these efforts. So you may be asking yourself, how can analytics be used in the management of supply chains? Uh, depending upon your background, this slide may be old news to you, but I find it's useful to discuss supply chain analytics in the framework of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. You know, descriptive analytics, the biggest and most important part of the pyramid includes business intelligence and, and diagnostic analytics of the supply chain. How many of my trucks arrived on time? How productive were my manufacturing plants and my warehouses? How are these metrics trending? And are any of them worrisome? Predictive analytics is next. How do we predict what's going to happen next in our supply chain? That includes things like sales forecasting, uh, as, as uh, will be discussed next, as well as forecasting costs of your supply chain inputs and some types of supply chain simulation. Finally, the top of the pyramid, which by volume should occupy the least amount of time, is prescriptive analytics. Uh, what should I do with my supply chain? Uh, this is my wheelhouse uh, and includes things like supply chain network design discussed today, as well as inventory optimization and other types of supply chain simulation. Now, a key point for this audience, especially, is that open source technologies are really changing the landscape in supply chain management and supply chain analytics. Uh, when you look at each of these capabilities, you can mentally pick out which R or Python packages you could use for them. Uh, this really is a sea change from when I started in the supply chain analytics field about a decade ago when the toolkit consisted of Excel for data analysis, SPSS for statistics, and commercial visualization software like Tableau. So what is supply chain network design? Uh, put plainly, it's the strategic analysis of the locations and activities of the various elements of a firm supply chain. For example, if I'm a manufacturer, uh, where should I locate warehouses for my raw materials, the stuff I use to make other stuff, or my semi-finished goods, which are items that are only partway through the manufacturing process? Where should I put my manufacturing facilities, my plants? Where should they go? Where should I put my distribution centers, my warehouses for finished goods? Where should they be located? And if I'm a retailer, how should I use my stores as a link in my supply chain? For example, many, many leading retailers, including my former employer, Target, use their stores as strategic assets for shipping e-commerce orders. Well, from where should we do that? That's a big question. That's a supply chain network design question. Supply chain network design seeks to answer these big questions, all with the intent to understand the impacts on profitability, cost, service, and other key metrics, and with a goal to minimize or maximize one or two key metrics, usually cost or profitability. Today, I'll be focusing on a relatively simple example of supply chain network design, a distribution network with two echelons, the distribution centers or warehouses and customers that are serviced by those warehouses. In designing the supply chain, we ask ourselves, given a customer base of demand aggregated to a city level, one, where should we open distribution centers to satisfy that demand? And two, what customers should be serviced by or aligned to each distribution center? While most real life supply chain design problems are much, much more complex than this example, I hope it will be informative on how practitioners approach these kinds of problems and how we can use open source technology for them. So how do we do this? Uh, how can we answer these questions? We can answer them with optimization modeling. Optimization modeling is a mathematical technique that allows a practitioner to optimize a set of interconnected decisions where the decisions are constrained by real world limitations. Optimization solvers take the decision options formulated as a mathematical model and return the set of decisions that optimizes, minimizes or maximizes an equation that includes the decisions as inputs. This equation is formally known as an objective function. If anyone on here has an operations research background, I realize it's not the precise mathematical definition, but I find it to be useful in explaining the field. So in our case, the decisions we need to make are one, how many distribution centers to open and where should we locate them? And two, what customers to align to each distribution center? 
you can see that these decisions, they're interconnected because I can't align a customer to a distribution center in a certain city unless I also open a distribution center in that city. And the limitations on our decisions or our constraints, uh, they're one, that all customer demand must be met. Uh, we may have a minimum or maximum number of distribution centers. Uh, we may uh, really only realistically open distribution centers in certain locations. So we have to start with kind of a candidate set of cities. We may have a maximum volume per distribution center. That's uh, also called the capacity. And uh, for certain reasons, we may put a maximum distance between a customer and its servicing distribution center. And we'll see that later in an example. So we'll shortly transition to the Shiny app I built for the webinar, uh, but first I'll introduce this scenario. Now, because this is a simplified scenario, this is a simplified version of an app I would use for a, for a regular project. You are a supply chain data scientist at Heartland Widgets Incorporated. Uh, your company is the market leader in widget sales across an eight state area of the American Midwest. The pandemic induced shift in consumer demand from services to goods, as well as stay, stay at home orders has led to a boom in demand for your company's flagship product, the at-home widget. Faced with record demand, the director of supply chain network planning has asked you to, quote, reimagine the company's distribution network. You are to recommend the, uh, where to open Heartland's distribution centers, as well as the customer to distribution center alignment to achieve a minimal cost. Heartland Widgets has customers in 117 Midwestern cities, spread from the Dakotas in the West, all the way to my home state of Indiana in the East. Each city's demand is proportional to its population. So for example, Chicago, Illinois, which is a big city, you may have heard of it, has more demand than Fargo, North Dakota. Heartland is considering 20 cities for potential distribution center sites. Because each distribution center will cost $1 million to open, it may not be cost effective to open distribution centers in all 20 cities, but we're keeping our options open. So let's get a little bit more technical here. Uh, the decisions we need to make for Heartland widgets can be represented by variables. When we ask what customer should we align to which distribution center, this is equivalent to asking a set of yes, no decisions that must be made in concert. For each customer city I, should I service it by a distribution center in city J, yes or no. And making our decisions, we're limited to having exactly one yes per customer city. It has to be serviced by exactly one distribution center. Relatedly, we need to make decisions about how many distribution centers to open and where to locate them. This is a series of if-then decisions related to our alignment decisions. If at least one customer is aligned to a distribution center in, for example, Omaha, Nebraska, then we must open a distribution center in Omaha. The decision sets are interconnected. We cannot separate our decisions on where to locate our distribution centers from our decisions on how to align customers to distribution centers. Mathematical optimization, and more specifically, the techniques of linear and integer programming are ideal for making these kinds of interrelated decisions. When we use mathematical optimization, including for supply chain design, we're trying to minimize or maximize some equation that is the function of our decisions. In this example, Heartland Widgets wants to design the supply chain with the lowest total cost. The supply chain costs in this example are one, the opening costs for distribution centers, which are priced at $1 million each, Two, the handling costs at the distribution centers, which is one cent per unit per widget. And three, the transportation costs from distribution centers to customers, which are five cents per unit mile. Now a unit mile is moving one unit, one mile. So for example, if you have two widgets, two units, and you move them 100 miles, that's two times 100, 200 unit miles at five cents each, that's $10 to move to two units, 100 miles. You add up these three components, cost components, and it leads to the total supply chain cost that we're trying to minimize. Now, one of the tenets of supply chain design is that these cost components can be inversely related to each other. For example, the more distribution centers you have, the closer you are on average to your customers. Uh, and if you're closer to your customers on average, you're going to spend less on getting the product to them on that transportation cost because it's just closer. However, uh, the more distribution centers you have, the more you spend to open them in the first place. So there's an inverse relationship between the distribution center opening cost and the transportation cost to get the product to your customer. The more distribution centers you have, the more cost to open them and the less you spend on the transportation, inverse relationship. Optimization modeling helps us figure out these relationships and help and uh, find the optimal solution that takes into account the relationships between the costs. 
All right, so because this is an R meetup and I'm gonna demo a Shiny app, uh, I wanna go over the packages I used. Uh, this is a tidyverse centric solution for data prep, but I also use uh, DT, data table, and Vroom. Uh, Shiny dashboard is used for visualization and I use our hands on table to allow for interactive adjustment to input tables. Leaflet is used as a mapping solution and the core of the optimization modeling rests with the OMPR package and the open source Symfony optimization solver. As an aside, the CoinRR Foundation, the organization that maintains Symfony and other open source optimization tools like Pulp and Pyomo for you Python users, they need financial help. Uh, please consider donating via that GitHub link. All right, from here, I'm gonna work from the app, uh, but I have slides for backup in case of technical difficulties. I host my app on shinyapps.io. Uh, you'll see the address, but to avoid having technical issues, I'd ask that uh, you know nobody try to load it uh, while I'm giving the demo. All right, so this is a pretty sparse app uh, because it's a, a fairly simple example. And first step is uploading our data. So. We really only have two sets of input data, uh, our customer information and our distribution center information. I've prepped the data. So I'm gonna use Vroom here. And these are small files, but uh, even if they were large, they'd still upload pretty quickly because we're using Vroom. Then uh, saying yes, it's gonna be used. All right. So now gonna inspect this upload data and talk a little bit through it. First, our customer data. So our customers are, as mentioned, 117 Midwestern cities. And for each of these, we have city name, state, latitude and longitude, their demand, which is proportional to their population. Uh, and then we have this column called maximum miles to distribution center. Uh, you'll see later on in, the, in an example how we would use this essentially if you want to enforce a maximum distance from a customer to the distribution center that services it, you would set this column to that distance limit. Right now, I don't care about that. So I've set this number so insanely high that it doesn't really matter. Finally, we have this column called include. And this is a nice thing about using our hands on table because you can actually dynamically update the table that you use uh, later on in your app. So everything has a check mark here. If I unchecked any of these, they would not be used in the optimization model. So I'm gonna display the customer map. You see these 117 cities across the Midwest. And just as an example of how our hands on table works, I wanted to get rid of Rapid City, South Dakota. You see it's down here. Now it's gone, but I do care about our rapid city. So I'm gonna keep it back. All right, so that's how we're using our hands on table for the customer inputs. Distribution center, similarly, we have uh, 20 candidate cities across the Midwest and uh, for to put our distribution centers in. We have a latitude, our longitude, our capacity, which is the maximum volume that it can be have aligned to it. This is effectively infinite compared to our customer demand because uh, it's a very, very high number. Each of them costs uh, $1 million to open and our handling cost is one cent per unit as mentioned earlier. And this check mark allow essentially says, do I wanna consider this location? If I unchecked any of these, that location would just be taken out of consideration right away. So finally we have our, uh, some inputs here before we run the optimization. So I mentioned earlier that you can put a constraint around your minimum and maximum number of distribution centers. And so I'm gonna start off by saying, I'm going to have a minimum of one. I need a warehouse somewhere and a maximum of 20. Because there's only 20 options here, having 20 as your maximum is kind of like saying, I'm willing to take any of them. The transportation cost per, five, uh, per unit mile is five cents as mentioned. And these are some more technical things that I won't get into. All right, so when I click run optimization, what's happening now is my app is taking the customer information, the distribution center information, and the uh, maximum and ma minimum number of distribution centers and forming an optimization model on the backside on the Shiny App Server. It then finds the optimal solution, the minimal cost, 
and returns me uh, returns the uh, the outputs. Luckily, it worked as fast in this demo as it has in my practice. All right, so let's look and see what those optimal solutions are. So to service all of our customer demand for Heartland widgets, the optimal lowest cost solution is four distribution centers, one in Omaha, Nebraska, one here in Minneapolis, one in Chicago, and one in my old hometown, Indianapolis. You can see uh, the uh, cities that are serviced by each distribution center are represented by their color, you know, red for Omaha and, uh, and uh, blue for Indianapolis, green for Chicago, yellow for Minneapolis. And they're kind of geographically separated as we would kind of expect because you generally want to have your customers closer to your distribution center. This table is an alignment table, which is just the tabular version of the map that we're seeing above. So for example, uh, Ames, Iowa, which is over here, is serviced by the distribution center in Omaha, Nebraska. The farthest distance from a customer to its servicing distribution center is 415 miles. And that's from Rapid City, South Dakota, over here, all the way to Omaha. Take note of that uh, because we'll actually come back to that in a little bit. So what is the optimal cost here? The total supply chain cost uh, that can be the minimal supply, total supply chain cost in this scenario is $7.5 million over here. That includes $4 million in distribution center opening cost, 1 million per distribution center and four of them, $13,000 for handling at the distribution centers and about $3.5 million in transportation cost. So our total 4 million plus 13,000 plus 3.5 million equals $7.5 million. And that is our absolute lowest total cost. Now I'm gonna make a small detour before we get into another scenario uh, to explain more what we mean by constraints in supply chain network design. Uh, in optimization modeling, constraints are mathematical limitations on what set of decisions you can make that correspond to real life limitations. The more constraints you have in your model and in real life, the worse your objective function becomes. So in this case, the more the supply chain cost would be. Optimization modeling, including supply chain network design, is an exercise in understanding the trade-offs involved in making constraints more or less restrictive or tighter or looser, uh, which is the term of art. In designing your supply chain, the tighter the constraints, the higher the total cost becomes. Supply chain design is partly an art around understanding the additional expenses associated with tighter constraints. Next, we'll talk about what a couple of those constraints may look like. So, First, we see that the lowest total supply chain cost occurs when we have four distribution centers in these cities up here. So what what would happen if we actually force our model to have exactly three distribution centers? How will that change our cost? How will that change what our network looks like? This is actually quite straightforward to see. All we need to do is go back to our minimum and maximum number of distribution center constraints. So I'm going to change the minimum to three and the maximum to three. Because these are integer values by forcing your minimum and maximum to both be three, you're gonna end up with three distribution centers. I'm gonna click run optimization. Again, uh, and this optimization model is just running in the background with the additional constraint that it needs three, exactly three distribution centers. I'm gonna go back to my results, it'll refresh. And now we see that, uh, Instead of four distribution centers, we have the required three. And it's the same layout, except now Indianapolis is gone. Sorry to my Hoosier friends. And so question then, what does this do to our overall cost? Because as I mentioned, the tighter you make your constraints, the worse your objective function becomes in this, meaning the more you're going to pay on in total. So let's look at these outputs. Our DC opening costs are now $3 million because we only have three distribution centers and they're a million dollars a piece. Our handling cost is the same because it's the same for all distribution centers and we have the same amount of volume. But our transportation cost, which was $3.5 million before is now $4.6 million. So while our, dis our distribution center opening cost went down a million dollars, our transportation cost went up $1,100,000. And so our total cost went from 7.5 million to 7.6 million. 
So we see that this one change increases the cost. Now, $100,000 is a lot of money to a normal person. Uh, in the consideration of a base of 7.5 million, it's not a big difference, but it is an increase. So that's what we see when we just force exactly three distribution centers. Next, we'll see what happens when we enforce a maximum distance constraint between our distribution centers and our customers. Uh, this is often the case with food supply chains uh, because food is perishable and you don't want your food outside of a climate controlled warehouse for too long before it gets to a store. And so oftentimes when designing food supply chains, you would uh, put in a distance constraint. This is actually pretty easy to do with our Anton table and using this maximum miles to DC column. I'm going to say a maximum of 400 miles. between all of my customers and my distribution centers. As you may remember, the distance between uh, Rapid City, South Dakota and the distribution center in Omaha, Nebraska was 415 miles. So by adding this additional constraint, that alignment is not possible. It's, it's not gonna be allowed. So we just change that column. Change this back to one and 20 and run optimization. I'll give this a few more seconds. And if it doesn't uh, work as quickly as I thought, I'll just go to my slideshow. Okay. So instead of waiting that, we'll just go back to the slideshow here. So what would happen if we did force a 400 mile constraint is that instead of, you know, we'd still have four uh, distribution centers as the optimal setting, but instead of a warehouse in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, we would have it in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Why? Because that is the distribution center that allows Sioux Falls, which is a, or sorry, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota over here, which is a very remote customer to be within 400 miles. And the impact on the cost structure is that instead of, uh, instead of uh, $3.5 million in transportation cost, we now have $4 million in transportation cost. So by adding that additional constraint around 400 miles from your distribution center to your customers, your total supply chain cost rose from 7.5 million to $8 million. Let's say uh, we actually wanted to see uh, the overall total cost at different number of distribution centers. I went and ran this model, forcing it to have exactly one distribution center, exactly two distribution centers, three distribution centers, all the way to nine. I then recorded the cost components between the handling cost, the opening cost, and the transportation cost. The handling cost in green is flat no matter how many distribution centers you have because it's the same volume just split in different ways. This blue line is our distribution center opening cost, which is linear because with the more distribution centers, you're, you're spending another million dollars. Your transportation cost in red goes down. Because as I mentioned, the more distribution centers you have, the closer you are on average to your customers, so your transportation cost goes down. It goes down dramatically from one to two distribution centers, but then kind of flattens out. So there's not as much of a, of a benefit. So your total supply chain cost, which is this purple line, uh, is kind of a, a parabola. And the minimal cost occurs at four distribution centers, as we saw before. But between, for example, two and five, there's not a tremendous amount of difference. And so if I was doing an actual study uh, for a client, I'd be presenting something like this and saying, actually, while four distribution centers is your minimal cost network, between two and five, there's not much of a difference in cost and there's pros and cons of each of those. All right, uh, well, that's uh, most of the content folks. So really appreciate your time today. Uh, just wanted to wrap up by saying and emphasizing that uh, supply chain management really uh, was a behind the scenes corporate function until the beginning of the COVID pandemic, but now it's front page news, uh, we all see it. And analytics powered by open source programming languages, it really is changing the nature of this field. Uh, supply chain network design, uh, it's kind of an obscure part of supply chain analytics, but I find it to be a powerful tool in devising and evaluating your organization's supply chain strategy. And hopefully today, uh, you just got a, a taste of what that might look like. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you'd like to know more, uh, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, and I just want to 
That was a great presentation. Great, great presentation. I just want to reiterate to everyone. I see a bunch of questions coming in through the Zoom chat as well. If you could use the Slido, that would be super helpful, so we can kind of help see the questions versus comments in the chat. Um, but Ralph, I'd love to ask a few questions that came in on Slido now, and then we can hold a few others until the end as well. Absolutely. Um, but one I see was from Jerry. Um, that is, how large of a problem can the open source solvers handle from your experience? How often do you encounter models that would require a commercial tool? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can speak in generalities. I found that it's more just a question around what size of a machine you put it on. Um, I've ran some pretty large optimization models on open source solvers. Um, and if you have the right hardware and you know, you're kind of paying for it in your time or you're paying for it in your dollars. And so if you're willing to wait, you know, an hour longer than you would otherwise, it's well worth it. Um, I haven't in my, both in my consulting and in my corporate work, I've not encountered a size of a problem where an open source solver couldn't handle it. Just like wouldn't compute. Thank you. Um, I see Cynthia had also asked a question um, do these optimization packages allow for optimizing to more than one success metric at a time, like cost plus customer satisfaction? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you can kind of shape your objective function to reflect whatever combined metric you may care about. So in this case, the objective function that you saw was purely a cost function. Uh, but I've in the past done things like, well, here's my cost, and here's, for example, a customer service metric that is also a function of my decision variables, and you can weight them. Now, when you see the output, it's a number. It doesn't really reflect, like, you know, dollar bills on the table or anything like that, but it can kind of, uh, and the more heavily you weight cost versus customer success or customer satisfaction, that, uh, that combined metric can, can lean towards one way or the other. Great, thank you. Um, and I know a few people had asked this and were curious about the shiny code that you used and if you would feel comfortable um, sharing your slides as well as maybe some of the shiny code. Uh, I'd be comfortable sharing my slides. Uh, unfortunately, not, not the code. Uh, that's kind of a, a trade secret thing, but. And one, one last question. And then again, we'll cover additional questions at the end as well. I'm just excited to get to Laura's talk to. Um, but the next question was, how did your optimization run so fast? Are you using parallel packages? Uh, I mean, it's partially running so fast because it's a small example problem. Uh, but no, I'm not doing any parallelization or anything. It's just running on my on whatever machines can spun up on shiny apps. Thank you so much, Ralph, for a great presentation. And I know there's a, a bunch more questions here as well that we'll cover at the end. And something I should have noted from the beginning is in Slido, if you wouldn't mind maybe saying who your question is for. So at the end, it will be easier to separate them out for Ralph and Laura. Um, but with that, I'd love to turn over to our, our second speaker, Laura Darby Rose. Laura is manager of demand at Mallon Rock Pharmaceuticals, where she's responsible for statistical forecasting, forecast visualization, and forecast accuracy measurement. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Laura. Thank you, Rachel. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about our experience at Mallinckrodt um, with forecasting demand in R. So we went through a project about a year ago to replace a software as a service. I will not name that company. Um, my boss has advised me to not name it. <laughs> Um, with a, an open source R solution. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a demand manager, as Rachel mentioned. I'm, I work in the supply chain department. And in Mallinckrodt, we have a couple of different um, divisions. So I work for the specialty generics division. And we make basically generics that you might be prescribed when you go to the doctor or your nurse practitioner, wherever you might go to see. So a lot of pain management, acetaminophen, um, other things as well. So my main job responsibilities 
our stat forecasting and then measuring forecast accuracy. So not just of the stat forecast, but also um, our commercial partners provide a forecast based on kind of market intelligence info that they've collected. Um, they do not do stat modeling as far as I can tell, but they do submit a forecast. And then I wanted to add um, um, a caveat here that I only had about five months of experience regularly programming in R when I started the project. And I share that with you all to hopefully encourage um, people who are just getting started in R or Python and you know thinking about doing a project that will really involve um, R or Python. If you know enough to write a script, you probably know enough to do a, a project that will really impact your company. And I guess I didn't put this on the slide, but I'll mention it since I know Ralph mentioned uh, academic background. I am an economist by education. Um, I've worked most of my career in supply chain and really did a little bit of economic consulting, but found that I really enjoy supply chain. So um, here I am. Okay, so how the project began. So imagine it's spring 2020. Actually, you don't have to imagine, right? Uh, it's probably all still fresh in our minds and you're staying home um, being a good citizen and you're a little bored so uh, what did i do um, created a, a little shiny app a simple shiny app for time series forecasting and uh, shout out to the our ladies uh, organization i actually got the inspiration for the app from our ladies st louis meetup and um, so i used the materials that the presenter had provided to kind of dig into Shiny. I had taken a few online tutorials in Shiny, but never really done much with it. So, you know, I'm working remotely and I want to impress to my manager that, hey, I'm being productive. So in one of our calls, I showed him the app and um, he was impressed with it. And he thought, well, maybe we can replace the SAS that we were currently using for stat forecasting with this app or something like it. So the SAS that we were using um, cost about $200,000 per year, which for my company is um, not small change. We were definitely in a cost savings mode. It was also generating negative number demand forecasts. So keep in mind that that's, what do you even do with that, right? Um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna sell a negative number. Um, the IT support for this company could not figure out what was going on. So it was costing us like a lot of time and effort to basically modify these forecasts. So um, after my manager's initial approval, um, I collected some demand data. We, we chose about 30 SKUs that we thought were representative of, our, um, of the business. And I did a rolling forecast accuracy analysis. We wanted to have an idea before we proceeded further, what kind of accuracy we could expect if we switched to the R forecast package. That was what I was using at the time. I'll go more into that a little bit later. And specifically the ETS function, which is the exponential smoothing commonly used in univariate um, supply chain forecasting, also the ARIMA function. And there's um, options there for um, just best fit algorithm kind of a thing. So the ETS function was actually comparable to what was used or what we had enabled in the SAS um, various exponential smoothing models were selected by the demand forecaster. So I ran this um, rolling forecast accuracy analysis. And uh, to give, give you an idea um, of how uh, perhaps not efficient I was at the time, and I'm sure I'll be saying the same thing about myself in a couple of years today, but uh, I, I had three for loops that I used to do this. And anybody who's programmed in R for um, a while knows that's generally not the best strategy, but it did work. And uh, we, we were satisfied that, hey, just doing like setting the ETS algorithm to best, you know, best fit, minimizing the AICC, that's the Akai K information criteria and the corrected one, um, that was comparable to what we were getting in terms of forecast accuracy from our SAS. Also the benefit was, hey, we didn't need manual intervention from the demand analyst or manager. So we made the decision to move forward with this project. And then we had to get the buy-in from the IT group that at Mallinckrodt, not the, of course, the IT support at the SaaS company since it was in their budget. 
Well, as you can imagine, um, it wasn't difficult to get buy-in for a cost savings project. Um, they were also frustrated with the lack of support that we were getting from the SaaS company and the time required that we were all spending on doing useless tasks. So up till then, I had written some other scripts that I used for various data wrangling tasks, the kind of stuff you do in supply chain analysis, right, or demand planning, which is my specific area um, of expertise. And uh, we, we didn't want to just have me running scripts on RStudio desktop, as useful as the free version of RStudio is. Um, we wanted more enterprise capable options. So we looked into our studio server pro, and I believe the most recent version of that is called workbench. I'm not super up to date on that. And then we also contracted with lander analytics, um, and they helped with server setup and maintenance and then application installation. So it is a Linux server for those of you who might be more windows people and at Mallinckrodt, we're more of a windows shop is what I've been told by RIT group. So definitely need a little bit more guidance in setting that up. And we had both a um, production and dev server that were supported with them. Okay, so we're moving forward in this project. We made the decision to go forward. The IT analyst um, who was responsible for maintaining the data used for stat forecasting needed to collaborate with me to replace the data management. So not the forecasting, but um, those of you who might have used a SAS at your company for forecasting or other, other things, know that it, the SAS can sometimes do functions that are not just the main function that you may have purchased it for. So we needed to do in-house solutions, um, especially generics is kind of old school in a way. So we have like an AS400 system. So we needed to create a bunch of tables, um, make sure we were maintaining those tables, jobs were running, that kind of thing. So we had a tables for both um, cleansed history and non-cleansed history. So cleansed being removing outliers. Sometimes you might decide to not include all history for consideration in um, the stat forecast model because there might have been a structural change, something like that. So we, we wanted to move away from Excel spreadsheets. There is definitely a time and a place for spreadsheets, but um, we just didn't feel that, that was in the best interest of the business. So uh, we... We use the DBI package, which probably many of you are familiar with, and then the ODBC package, um, lowercase ODBC, I think there's a uppercase R ODBC package. And just using some basic SQL, we got those set up on, and it was very easy to um, con connect to the AS400 system, pull in those tables that I would need to estimate models and calculate forecasts. We also changed our outlier cleansing process, as I alluded to in the second point, um, and that is because we had previously cleansed the history directly in the SAS application. So we just moved to a pretty simple pr process. We were trying to come up with something in the limited time we had, and uh, we, we had an Excel upload. If you needed to remove an outlier, you'd upload an Excel file to our AS400 system. So probably could have been, well, we're changing the process actually now, and I'll get more to that in the future. But you know, it worked in the initial stages, it worked, and sometimes you have to go with that. And then we also needed a table to store stat forecast generated from the R script. So as I said before, no Excel files involved, we were going to write that to a table. And then we also needed another like a file or a table, so to speak, for storing historical forecasts, and that is to measure forecast accuracy. Okay, so we were able to use the RStudio Server Pro for other uses besides stat forecasting. As I alluded to earlier in my presentation, I had written some other R scripts to do a lot of data analysis and wrangling tasks, the kind of things that you don't want to spend a lot of time on if you can. Um, measuring weighted MAPE, we measure, weighted MAPE is what we use to measure our forecast accuracy. There are other metrics that your organization might use. Um, checking the commercial forecast upload versus the download. Um, I am responsible for loading the commercial partners forecast to the ERP system. And depend, depending on how things go, um, we might have kind of phantom forecasts hanging out in the ERP system. So I, it, it's hard to check that in just doing spreadsheet analysis, but it's it was fairly simple to write a program that did it in R. Also, um, last year with the pan, well, I said last year, I guess this two years ago almost now, uh, we had a lot of order orders for acetaminophen with the start of the pandemic, and um, our product director needed some help in understanding how to allocate um, orders 
and versus forecast. So we have a certain amount of product and based on the forecast the customer provided, they were either going to get product or have to kind of go to the end of the line, so to speak. And there were some other ones I won't, for the sake of time, I won't uh, bore you guys with the details of those. So it was very, it was simple to set these jobs up to run on the server um, using cron R. And that's, um, as you would expect by the name, it's an R package, which interfaces with cron. So the script saved a lot of time, all these jobs set up. Um, we could compile a lot of data reports, no intervention, or maybe a little bit of just give, a, give it a you know, check from demand managers. And then the real test is when I was out on short-term disability um, this past summer, uh, the jobs ran well. They saved my coworker a lot of time having to cover you know, my responsibilities as well as his. So my coworker left the company in November. So I've since been taking over um, his former duties. And I've been uh, writing various R scripts to kind of hopefully improve some of the processes. And it really has made it possible scheduling these, these jobs on the R Studio server uh, pro interface has really made it possible for me to do my job as well, well as his previous duties. Okay, to summarize the project, you're probably wondering how long did all this take? Um, it took about 11 months. And I will say this, um, you could probably do this kind of project where you totally re replace the software you've been using um, in less time. We happened to have a lot of time based on when the contract with the SAS was going to be up. And so we had several months in early 2021 where we were running both concurrently. Um, there are definitely improvements to be made to the forecasting processes. And I can tell you that as well as anybody at the company. Um, that's what I deal with day in, day out. But the initial goal of replacing the SAS with a solution at least as effective was completed. So we consider that the initial stage to be a success. We measure on a lag three forecast accuracy, which basically um, takes into consideration, essentially it's sort of like lag four, if you think about it, it takes history from four months ago when, you, when you're measuring the particular month in question. But it's been about the same, depending on the month, a little bit worse, a few percentage points. But we did meet our goal for 2021. So uh, my boss is happy, I'm happy. And the cost savings is definitely worth it for a slight trade off in accuracy. And we are still using pretty simple models like, uh, you know, ARIMA exponential smoothing models. So we hope that as we introduce new models, um, we will improve accuracy over time. And then I, I alluded to this earlier in the presentation. So I started out with the forecast package in summer 2020. And then I found out, <laughs> I guess it was probably old news, but it was new news to me at that time about the tidyvert suite of packages, which is kind of the replacement for the forecast package. And so I switched to that. I switched over the code that I had written to that and took a little bit to kind of make sure I understood everything, but it's a great, great suite of packages that includes Fable, Feast, Sybil, um, Sybil data, I think. So I have found those to be really useful for automatic forecasting. If you have a lot of SKUs and you don't have time to go in and like tweak parameters, you know, figure out the best Arima model, figure out your, the best exponential smoothing model, for instance, like univariate forecasting, um, the models they produce, the forecast for a supply chain are stable forecasts. Um, they don't require a lot of intervention. You're not going to get anything unbelievable or uh, crazy, I guess. Okay, so. I mentioned the Shiny app earlier. So the impetus of the project started with a simple time series forecasting app. We made the decision to forecast with a script scheduled as a monthly job instead of an app. And part of the reason for that was it seemed simpler at the time, um, time savings. Also, it ended up working out. We weren't really ready to go with our Studio Connect at the time, which we would have needed to host an app for an enterprise um, in an enterprise capable way. So. After that, I developed another Shiny app kind of based on the first one, kind of, um, which is more uses a number of different packages, the Tidyverts packages, of course, DT, I think Ralph mentioned that in his app. To edit history, you can change parameters, um, basically interfaces with our AS400 system via SQL. So you can, through the app, you can interactively like edit our, um, our data in our company systems. And this allows me to, especially for those high volume, really important SKUs to go in and pick out specifications I think are optimal. So we're hoping that um, this will give us more opportunity to kind of tune a better model for um, the SKUs that we consider to be, you know, A SKUs important. 
this the, the impetus for creating this app was actually my former coworker, um, and he wanted something that that mimics some of the functionality that we had in our previous app. So he liked being able to go in, play with parameters, kind of test things out, see if how if you change the history, how does this change the forecast, that kind of a thing. Look at different accuracy metrics as he was um, creating his forecast. So the future state, um, it's always good to be thinking about continuous improvement, right? So I'm working on um, another shiny app to visualize our generics data, that's our finished dosage data, um, with a pivot table, probably using the pivot tabler um, package, not sure yet, I might look into a few other packages. And then we either look at monthly or weekly doses uh, or bottles, depending on what the user would want. So I currently use this very slow tool um, using a legacy system I will not name. And uh, we, we use this for creating vis visualizations for the demand review slide deck, where we look at our customer demand, compare that to our, um, look at our forecast, see what's changed, look at our financials, that kind of a thing. So this will help me um, more than anybody else, but I'm definitely interested in improving my processes. And then another project we started last month is um, looking at the commercial team forecast. So they currently don't use much statistical forecasting. So they are interested though in looking at their end purchaser demand and how we can roll that up under distributor customers. Um, Mallinckrodt is a, a manufacturer. So we sell to some big time distributor customers you may have heard of in the news. Um, and there's certain customers that are pricing contracts and then those distributor customers sell to, you know, more of retail pharmacies kind of a thing. So we're hoping to get a better picture of our demand to kind of tie that out and um, build a better forecast for them in that way. And then in terms of model improvement, um, those of you who are familiar with the Tidyverts packages probably know that you can do hierarchical forecasting as well. We did explore that a little bit in the initial stages of the project, excuse me, when we were trying to understand what we wanted how um, how much we wanted to experiment with different kinds of models. My boss thought it wasn't a good idea at the time, but now that we've completed the initial stage, we'll probably look into that a little bit more. And then also machine learning methods for time series. We would need to do that on weekly data. We don't have enough monthly data really to make it worth it, but model time is a, a good package. So that's um, that is something that probably this year we are looking into exploring. So to summarize, um, I just a lot of this on this slide is common sense, but I think it's probably worth reiterating. You're interested in doing like a project where you replace a um, you know a SaaS with an R solution. Start sooner versus later. Um, something that we learned sometimes the hard way is that the SaaS will perform other functions besides forecasting. Um, so you need to come up with solutions for data storage and management. And those solutions might not be R specific, but they need to be compatible with you, you know, whatever you're doing in R for forecasting. So you might need to create a database, a data warehouse, maybe you already have something like that at your company or your organization. Also project management um, 101, I guess, make sure you've an estimate the time involved on your part, as well as many collaborators, because you, you don't want to come up to the end of the project and figure out that they don't have enough time to give you to complete the project. And then I wish I somebody had told me this ahead of time. Learning some project management skills is helpful. Probably a lot of us on this call are um, have good technical skills. Um, I When I was trying to map out this process, which is my um, subsequent point, I, I had really no idea what I was doing. And it, it got done, but it, it could have been a lot, a lot more efficient. Okay, and then uh, I feel like I, I might be a little bit of a broken record here, but you don't want to realize you haven't accounted for something you previously relied on the SAS to do when you've almost completed the project. And as you probably expect, we learned that the hard way there was my coworker used the SAS for something I did not exactly know what he was doing. And I think there was a miscommunication between perhaps an IT, um, analyst and him, not just throwing blame, but we, we realized, oh, we never accounted for this. Now it's, we're practically finished with this project. And we need to make sure we have something that will allow him to do what he did with the SAS. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna have our experience there. And then I, I'll finish, um, hopefully this is not too uh, pessimistic of a note, but with a 
paraphrasing of Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will. So plan for all the contingencies. And since we're all in supply chain planning, that shouldn't be too hard. Okay, that's all I've got. Uh, questions, I guess, Rachel, um, I don't know how we're gonna- Yeah, I, I, can, I can help with reading this, but thank you so much, Laura. That was an awesome presentation. Really appreciate it. Sure thing. I see a lot of uh, great comments in the chat as well. And just want to remind people, if you could use the Slido link to ask questions, that is super helpful for helping us organize them. Um, but I, I did see one question that just came through quickly on the chat was, if you could please repeat the name of the package that you used, which allows a user to edit data interactively. Oh, sure, sure. DT, but I know um, and Ralph mentioned this in his presentation, our hands-on tables, another good one. And there are other ones out there. I was familiar with DT and I'd already gone down that path. Um, so I was just like, I'm sticking with it. If I was building it from scratch, maybe I'd do our hands-on table. But yeah, there are several good packages out there. Cool, thank you. Um, another question from Slido was, what type of data are you forecasting on? Invoice sales, demand, POS? <laughs> Demand data. So we have two divisions. Um, yeah, invoice sales. Um, yeah, it's it's by request date. So it's not shipment. It's supposed to be a representation of what our true demand is. So not taking into account any supply supply issues. So we sell business to business. So we, we supply um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies you probably heard of in the news. And I that's all I can say about that. And then we also supply some, um, you know, distributor pharmacies, and that's our dosage product. So, so the kind of stuff that you might um, get prescribed if you, you know, for pain management or other conditions. Thank you. Um, but Laura, one question was, if you had unlimited budget, would you prefer one modeling in R and then passing results to Tableau or two modeling and displaying in R and Shiny? So R and Shiny is a clear, um, a clear winner for me. So I have used a um, commonly, oh, I, 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 I can't name names, but a commonly used data visualization tool, which is uh, um, kind of a click and drag and everything. And I just don't find it. I like to know what's going on behind the scenes. And, you know, when I'm writing that shiny code, I know how things fit together. But when I'm doing, if I was doing something more in Tableau or another uh, tool, I wouldn't, you know, and I know there's beautiful visualizations that can be done in Tableau, but I wouldn't have the same sense of control. So that's, that's my personal preference. And I'm not saying it's the only, it's the right one. Thanks, Laura. Um, and I'm going to try and also pull people into the discussion and allow people to unmute yourself. I know this is dangerous with 300 people, but Eduardo, I saw you had a great question that you put into the Slido as well. And I was wondering if you'd want to read that one out loud and add some context there. And I can start by reading the question too. Um, but it was... Laura, did you have to deal with uploading um, back the forecast to ERP? If that was the case, were there any guidelines you had to follow with IT? Um, so you're talking the stat forecast, I assume. I mean, I know I mentioned doing a check of an upload. So I'm assuming you're going with stat forecast here because that's what we the models estimated and calculated are. So I actually worked, the nice thing about designing the system on your own, again, maybe I'm a control freak, but I hope not. Um, is that I had a chance to work with the IT analyst and he and I have a very good working relationship to say, okay, this is the kind of table we want to build. I need this field. I need this field. I need this field. So we kind of had a custom solution built. Um, I think within my, we use within the service account, which we use on our studio and that's so it's not tied to my personal account. So any, it can run if I'm on short-term disability or whatever. Um, there, I think we had to have like permissions edited set so that anybody could, you could write with that account to the table. That's a, you know, pretty simple fix though. So no, they were, they were basically like, what do you need from IT? And I was like, here's what I want. Here's why I want it. And they said, okay. Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, one other question that came through on Slido was how do you source snapshots of your forecast for later accuracy analysis? Okay, yeah, I kind of did allude to that, I guess. So we are, um, 
we every every this is something that IT team handles. Well, I guess I could theoretically do this in R, but at the end of the month, um, before the table that receives the forecast um, is is cleared, that that forecast, so all 67,000 now lines of it or whatever, we forecast three years out. No, that's just nothing magic about three years, just how we do it. Um, it's copied to another table that has, I think we store 13 months of historical forecasts. And then when I measure um, statistical MAPE, the script pulls in from that historical table and it filters. I use um, some of the, the DBI interfaces and um, there's in the parameter, argument, you can say, I want to pull in based on this criteria. And you pull in whatever might be your lag three forecast or lag one. So that's how we measure it. But yeah, we do track our um, stat forecast accuracy uh, pretty carefully. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And I see there are a ton of questions <laughs> that have come in here too. So a few of them don't say if it's for Ralph or Laura either, um, or, or both. So I'd love to throw some questions at you as well, Ralph, from earlier too. Um, but one was, um, Ralph, what R packages do you use for operations research optimization problems? Yeah, so for optimization, uh, the biggest ones I use is the OMPR, uh, which stands for, I think, Optimization Modeling Process in R. I'm not sure about the P, but, uh, and essentially it, it's a, pretty intuitive way to take linear program or integer program optimization models and formulate them in R. Um, and that's kind of modeling language package. And then there are some adjacent packages that actually then send it to the solver of your choice. And so if you go on the packages uh, GitHub site, it's, it's very easy to read. Uh, but I like that because it's, it's built with a tidyverse centric mindset. Uh, so for example, you use pipes to add components of your model. And you can do whatever code you need to do to prep your input tables and then just send it into your optimization model, which is how I'm able to kind of dynamically change the inputs and then re-optimize on the back end. So that's that's probably what I use. Great, thank you. Um, and one other question for Laura, and then I'll turn it over to you, Curtis, and then we'll kind of go back to open discussion and remainder of the questions. Um, but the question, Laura, was thanks for the inspiring presentation. How did you manage our package updates in your organization? Um, and did the IT admin control the package updates? That's a good question. I'm trying to think. Um, probably the first thing is I guess I should become clean that I probably don't <laughs> update my packages as often as I should. I am actually the only user of R in my division. I'm not sure about, we have specialty brands too. So in terms of managing across the organization, it hasn't been an issue at this point. If we do bring on another um, analyst or we have a current person who learns R and kind of decides to do some stuff with it, that'll probably become more of an issue. But I do use, um, this isn't quite exactly your question, maybe it's helpful. I use uh, R3, I don't know if I feel bad admitting this, but 3.6.3 .3 for some of my scripts. I know I'm really old. Um, but then I use 4.1.0 for stat forecasting because we do use parallel processing for part of that. And it's just the time difference was we were getting timeout issues. It was just really a big difference. And when you set up a job, um, you can specify which version of R you want uh, to use. That's not a package question, though, but you can use both. And it's nice. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. And Curtis, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to you to have you kind of give us some more information on the working group that we're trying to form as well um, and to kind of get us all thinking about what resources may, what we might want to contribute there too. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for presenting and we'll get back to the questions in a moment, but uh, we also did want to take an opportunity with this, with this group um, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of interest in combining open source software plus to, to solve the problems that folks in supply chain management have. Um, the the kind of too long, didn't read or didn't listen version of what I'm about to say is if you if you consider yourself kind of one of two people, uh, either keenly interested in kind of community organizing for supply chain management, or keenly or interested in contributing 
uh, resources to the community, whether it be our packages or articles, kind of sharing uh, best practices that other people could benefit from. I really encourage you to have a look at the link that I just shared. It's an rstv.io link. Have a read over the kind of proposal we we present there, uh, and you know consider participating and, and and you know submitting your name. The longer version is right. There's a lot of interest in um, supply chain management plus open source software. And so, you know, Rachel, Ralph, and I had talked a couple of months ago now, actually, about kind of how to take this community to the next level. Um, there's certainly a lot of industry groups as well as, you know, field groups that have, uh, you know, set uh, kind of templates that communities could, could follow. So, you know, I have a lot of colleagues in R and Pharma, for example, and they have a nice conference that brings everyone together and shares resources. Uh, a lot of groups uh, create shared packages uh, with kind of common solutions. Uh, there's a lot of ways to, to approach it. Um, you know, we we propose um, a working group to kind of create a community hub for you folks, where you could share resources and share best practices that you would all then be able to to benefit from and, and develop together. Um, so again, if that, if you kind of consider yourself one of those two groups, I would really encourage you to have a look at that link and consider uh, sub submitting your name. What we do after that is we'll follow up uh, shortly after to kind of bring those folks together and continue the conversation about how to take this community to the next level. The other thing I didn't mention is I'm Curtis. I work at our studio. I'm a community organizer. I've been with you guys with our studio for a while and you know been watching the community grow for, for years. So super happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Curtis. And Thank if you. anybody yeah. has questions about that too, or um, please feel free to even raise your hand on the Zoom call or reach out to me directly too. Um, but I see Curtis, you shared that link in the chat there. So awesome. I know there are a ton of questions still on Slido, so I can go over to those too. Um, but also, if you're if you're here and have a burning question that you love to ask live as well, feel free to raise your hand on on Zoom too, and I can call on you. So Laura, one. Other question that was on that looks like it came in pretty recently was, did you experience any challenges in change management when it came to convincing stakeholders to use the analytics tools and forecasts? No, I didn't. And that's because it was less work for pretty much everybody. Um, yeah, so if you can make people's lives simpler, it's very easy to get by. And if you can convince them to do that, I was recently on a call with the director of IT, as well as my boss, who's the senior director of supply chain. And the director of IT was like, yeah, it's saving us 200,000 a year. It's less work for the IT analysts. And he was like, yeah, it's been great. And we've, you know, um, so I think and my old coworker, he, I think, liked have, having not to do as much work. Because I also had some R scripts that did his mate processing and other things for him, helped him check his uh, forecast upload, that kind of a thing. So make people's lives simpler and they will be happy to change in my experience. I love that. And I see one of the most upvoted questions right now is, I hope you got a raise for the $200,000 in cost savings. I, I, did get, uh, I did get a raise, yes, and a promotion, <laughs> so. Congratulations. Um, so a few other questions here. So for Ralph, there was one, how do you incorporate uncertain inputs like Laura's demand forecast into models to be run in deterministic solvers? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, this is kind of where the art and science come together. Uh, and so there's a couple ways. Uh, the way I, I primarily like to use is essentially use uh, simulation to change the inputs. So for example, if the demand for Ames, Iowa was not this number, but rather we think it's from here to here, you kind of do a sampling of each of those, you run the optimization. And overall, you do this a bunch of times to kind of compare the outputs and see how different really are the recommendations. Like if it's always recommending these four warehouses, those four warehouses are a good choice. If there's radically different outputs, then you kind of got to dig a little bit deeper. Thanks, Ralph. And I see another question was, um, could you, it could be for either of you, but could you talk a bit more about compliance um, for an in-house application? Yeah, Rachel, would, or sorry, uh, Laura, would you mind taking that? I, I'm kind of- Sure, yeah. Um, so compliant, my 
I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. If you if you are able to get a little more color and put that in the chat or somewhere else, um, perhaps Rachel can give me some insight into that. Because we use statistical forecasting, we were using it, I was gonna say, as more of a benchmark for our commercial partners. Um, there wasn't a lot of compliance per se. Now pharma, especially opiates, which is the, um, the one of the products that Mallinckrodt makes is very highly regulated, as you know. But the commercial teams, their forecast has to submit a lot more customer level evidence to the DEA for quota. Um, for statistical forecasts, we're basically saying, what does our demand say? So there wasn't as much of a compliance issue. And my company, I will say for being a fairly large organization, people are pretty agile about, hey, if something works and we like it, we're going with it, as long as we're not obviously breaking any laws or, you know, circumventing regulations. So if you have any more compliance with IT, I see someone says compliance with IT standards. Um, yeah, I mean, they were... I guess maybe my, maybe I'm very fortunate to have an I, a really chill IT team, but they they were like, yeah, let's go for it. It sounds good as long as they have the time to do it, which they they did. So, and then I see someone else say compliance. My financial division will kill me if I do that. Well, I mean, I go back to my previous comment. Uh, if you can simplify their lives, maybe they would reconsider. So, hopefully that's helpful. I like that. That idea of simplifying others, other people's lives <laughs> to push things forward. Um, and another upvoted question was, what metrics do you use to measure forecast accuracy? And I'm not sure if we had covered this at all. Yeah, I guess I briefly touched on it in my presentation. We use weighted MAPE. So that's, that's how we define that. There's a couple different definitions, but it's basically the sum of all of the absolute variances. So at, we measure at a skew level. You can do it at different levels. Um, forecast minus demand or absolute forecast minus demand over the sum of all the demand. So that it essentially gives more weight to um, higher, you know, higher volume skews, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, I know it's, it's all aggregated, but we don't really pay attention as much to those little volume skews because, hey, if they're really accurate or if they're not, their absolute variance is never going to be that that big. So. Thanks, Laura. And I know I mentioned this before, but if you have a question and you want to ask it out loud too, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom or even just unmute yourself and, and jump in. I, I know it's very hard to recreate that in-person feel <laughs> virtually, but would love to hear from you all. Um, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So I am looking into breaking into the R scene but I have like a little bit of experience, prior experience, but not a not much. How do you recommend I go into this? Should I start learning R first, like the syntax and all of that, and then doing project, or should I just dive right in and start doing projects that I can find plenty of on Kaggle? I'm happy to take this, Ralph. If you want to chime in, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but I'm more I, you. Have, I have less experience than you, so maybe yeah, it's more I mean, I, more I recent in my memory. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll give my, and then I'm sure Ralph will have some interesting things to add. I would say you want to be at the level where you can at least understand how functions work. You could, I mean, tidyverse is really kind of an, I know people like data table too. I personally am not familiar with it. Um, but tidyverse is kind of an essential, I would say, to, if you're doing, for supply chain, you know, you're doing all this data analysis and manipulation, wrangling, all that kind of stuff. You should be able to comfortably write at least a fairly a simple R script. Um, and you do learn as you go along. Sometimes the best way to learn is to actually pursue something. I think once you have a deadline, that's where it all becomes real, you know? So make sure that you've got something working before you can't give the cancel notice to your SAS or whatever else you're going to be doing. That's going to like be involve money on the line, I guess. So that's my advice. But yeah, I mean, if you can write a simple R script, you're probably ready to start some kind of project. Go for it. Yeah, I concur. I mean, vast majority of work in supply chain is data prep and data analysis. So if you can start with a, kind of a, a tidyverse education, that's uh, probably best. And then just learning functional programming from there is good. Thanks, Val. I'll read one of the Slido questions to you. But again, raise your hand on Zoom too if you want Hello, to jump I in. Have oh, there you go. Hello, yep. I have one question. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, yes, ma'am, uh, for forecasting, uh, for forecasting in a 
लाइक वेट वेट इन फोरकास्टिंग इन सप्लाय चेन सिसम देर इज एंड फोर सिस्टम फोर फोरकास्टिंग मेथड लाइक टाइम सीरीज फोरकास्टिंग इकोनोमेट्रिक मॉडल जजमेंट एंड फोरकास्टिंग एंड डेल्फी मेथड सो विच इज एडोप्टेड फॉर द प्रिसाइज आउटकम So judgmental forecasting really wouldn't involve any statistical modeling per se. You kind of just say, "I think this is best," and that's that's kind of that's somewhat of what our commercial partners do. I mean, I think they do some trending and things like that. I have not quite gotten a super clear explanation, which I will probably be learning more about that as I uh, go into this project with them. Um, Delphi method, if I'm, my memory serves me accurately, and someone feel free to jump in on the chat if I got this wrong, as I've Kind of a consensus panel of experts, um, and that—I mean—that would probably more not fall under this kind of project. And there might be some products for which you want to do that, um, but that's not, you know, at the middle-level manager, high-level analyst, data scientist role. That's probably not what you would be doing as much, unless you maybe you could put a variable in the model that, you know, I'm just brainstorming here that would account for that. But I don't, I don't. I'm not involved in that in my company. I see Todd has asked a question on Slido that was, um, is a distance calculation line of sight or road network based? What options are available to the solution? I think that yeah, might so, be for you, Ralph. Yeah, um, yeah, so it is uh, line of sight, uh, just kind of as the crow flies for speed. Uh, you can certainly do road distance calculation and use it. It's just a distance matrix and then put, and uh, so like, for example, you can use, uh, there's some open source options. Uh, for my work, I use Google Maps API uh, because that's kind of the gold standard of quality and it's quite easy to use. But yeah, you can do it either way. In this particular demo, it's just straight line. Uh, Rachel, I see something from A Zoha in the chat that I wanted to address. I don't, she said her microphone or he or she oh, said her microphone is not working correctly. Special. So the question is, um, how do you handle special events like promotions and advertising your stat models? So their company runs a lot of promotions, but not during the same months. So this is a case where you would definitely probably want some sort of time series regression model. In, in generics, we cannot do promotion. So we can't say, hey, we got a hydro promotion going on. Obviously, DEA would not like us if we did that. So um, if, in that kind of industry, like a consumer packaged goods, perhaps, or something, you it, you could, if you had a, um, a forecast from that was going to happen, and then maybe a past time series of that, you would want to put that as an explanatory variable in your model. I see one from Yoni. How do you describe your clients' counterparts? What factors are driving your optimization forecasting models? This one might be for both Ralph and I. Um, let's see. I my counterpart. Well, there's just me in demand planning now. So um, my boss and I. He's got a pretty good technical understanding of things. The big concern at my company, and this is not every company, is forecast accuracy. So if the accuracy is good, if I could be doing the most complicated machine learning model that anybody ever thought of they would they would be it, it wouldn't make that much of a difference but i do realize that that's not the same for everybody else so uh ralph you probably have a couple things to to add about that or adjust about that yeah um i mean it, it's largely like saying okay here's how here's how our model solving is is happening like what's underneath the hood in the business sense you know here's the three cost components here's how you might see the trade-offs um Sometimes there's, it gets a little bit tricky because sometimes you see outputs that, oh, that doesn't make sense. Well, it actually does once you take into account all the constraints and things like that, but you just need to hopefully build the credibility first that it, they can take the hand wave explanation at that point. Thanks, Rob. Um, I know we're getting to 30 minutes past the hour. Um, so we have a few more questions here and I know a lot of people have to drop, but I do want to say if anybody wants to stay on and just kind of chat with each other, we could we can stay on past the time too. Um, maybe pretend like we're all in person. <laughs> but uh, one of the questions was, how have you dealt with time series model forecasting when there has been such a large change in values? For example, the price of things. So that's a good, really good question. I would say if you have pricing data, you could put that like price elasticity of demand. You could put that as an explanatory variable in your model. I was 
dealing with univariate here, and univariate is not always the best choice if you have things that correlate well. In my company, we have pricing contracts. Our price actually does not um, change very much. And I think our uh, commercial team is not particularly, they don't like to change price very much, which means if you don't have enough X variation in your data, it's not gonna be a good, you know, you don't wanna, you wouldn't include it in your model. Um, so let's see, I think that mostly addressed it, addressed that, but yeah, if you, I mean, the moral of the story is, I think I probably, I, maybe I'm sound like a broken record here. If you can do, um, you know, a regression or some other type of model where you have, you're bringing other factors, do it because you're probably going to get some more information there. If you find of course good correlation between the outcome and the, the predictors. Thanks, Laura. Um, Ralph, I see you had answered this on Slido, but someone really wants to know the, this, and I see a few questions coming in with this. Um, which optimization algorithm did you use in your app? Uh, so it's a mixed integer linear program for those who are, are familiar with operations research terminology. Uh, essentially, you just, the OMPR package builds the model uh, based on your parameters and then sends it to a solver. And solvers, uh, a lot of people, dedicated people work in those, but essentially it uses a lot of different approaches to solving the problem and picks the best one, essentially. Great. Thank you. Um, Mohit, Mohit I, um, apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I see you had asked a question or had raised your hand as well, if you want to jump in. Uh, yes. Uh, so my question was uh, regarding the correlation factor, uh, correlation analysis, which Laura was uh, speaking about like uh, if the price is correlated with the demand, like you just put it as an external variable. So does that require any analysis beforehand you put in those external variables or you could just dump all the variables you are thinking which might be correlated and let the like the, just the algorithm decide which ones are best and so what is the correct approach as per your experience? I just wanted to ask that. Good question. I feel like I could teach a class on that. And um, it's funny you you bring this up because I see um, someone, Federica, hey, Federica, I think she's still on, from my uh, book club ISLR um, that I'm in, where they talk about different models or different ways to select your best, you know, the variables you want to include. I mean, a correlation matrix is a good, you know, first start. Obviously, if you see something that's not highly correlated, you may want to consider dropping it. Um, academics versus business people approach things a little bit differently in terms of how, how they would think about a model and report that. I'm assuming your prop might be in business. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you could, there's different methods. Um, maybe I should say join the ISLR book if you want to find out some more about subset selection. But uh, correlation is a good way to get started. And then think about, does it have any theoretical basis, right? If it, if it does, then maybe you should include it, at least try it out in the beginning. But without seeing data, it's kind of hard for me to give a more uh, in-depth answer. So hopefully that helps you out. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and I, I see there is also another question that is, what is the best way to connect with both of you, Laura and Ralph, after the meeting, if people wanted to ask follow-up questions or connect, is it LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, LinkedIn or email. LinkedIn is fine. I, I I think a lot of us get a lot of spam in our inbox, but I try to respond to messages that don't look too spammy. <laughs> um, I think my email might be on my LinkedIn, um, but yeah, you're welcome to email me. Uh, I mean, I'll try to respond. I'm actually pretty much like an email, so. But yeah, That's feel fun. free to feel free to I to discuss or there's the um isn't there the chat supply chain on the R oh, on the yeah, R for data science Slack too? If you you're interested, that's a good. Um, I mean, it's not super active, but there's no reason why it couldn't be more active. Definitely, I was just gonna mention that too. So after the first R and supply chain meetup, um, we did make a group on the R for data science online learning community. Um, and so it is chat dash supply chain. And if anybody wants to join that group, I'll put the link in um, to join that Slack community in the channel or in the Zoom chat too. I see Federica put something in about the book clubs. So yeah, if you, I would say those book clubs, I guess I'll give a shout out to the, I want to give a shout out to the book clubs, really good way to kind of discuss with like-minded individuals, different modeling, um, you know, techniques, especially if you don't have somebody in your organization that is also doing this kind of stuff, or if you're working remotely and you, you know, 
it's a nice way to connect with like-minded uh, individuals. Definitely. Um, and I, I did just put my LinkedIn there too. Feel free if, if anybody has any other follow-up questions or wants to connect to connect there or share your own LinkedIn's in the, the chat too, to network with each other. Um, also, somebody had asked if it was okay to share an open job posting in the, this chat channel as well. Um, and definitely. So if anybody on the call is hiring for supply chain professionals, please feel free to, to share that there too. And thank you, Federica, for putting the link to um, Hello. the book club too. Uh, can I ask one question? Uh, I have sure. One query. Yeah. So my question is that to how uh, you how any organization utilize the customer sentiment to uh, anal uh, forecast or, or, or demand forecast for supply chain analysis? How any organization uh, utilize do, do, what, May sentiment? I ask what may I ask what industry you're in? Uh, consumer packaged goods or durable goods. Um, I mean, do you, are you talking about maybe getting a, are you talking about cost, like a government data index where I think there are, it's been a while since I did economic consulting, but I think there are um, uh, d data uh, that you can download sentiment. So, I mean, you could download that data. Uh, I think there's probably some R packages that could do that and put it as a predictor in your model. Um, that's be something I think maybe you could, if you really want to be creative, uh, and you had surveys from your own customers, maybe you could construct some kind of index that you read in that survey data and assigned a numerical weighting. You could, you know, uh, use that or, or other kind of feedback from, um, your, perhaps a website or something else. I'm not, I haven't worked in, um, consumer packaged goods for a few, several years, so it's, I'm not super um, up on whatever might be the new techniques, but those are a couple ideas that come to my mind. Thanks, Laura. Um, I do, I, Vasilios, I did see your hand was raised, so I'd love to just have that be the last question too, if you want to jump in. Hi, th thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you both to, to Ralph and Laura for great presentations. Um, so just a very quick question. Uh, <laughs> and to anyone who's actually, you know, relevant to the subject, um, have you also used, have you also measured bias to optimize your forecasts or just accuracy measures? And if you did, like, how, you know, how did you do that? Uh, in R, outside of R, just some basics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, and I think you might, I think I'm going to miss that question in the chat earlier. So thank you for asking that. We do measure bias. Um, well, we have, so the bias for, I think, perhaps many of you on the call know this, but it's basically the variance over the demand. So some of all the variances. So that is basically directionally, do you under forecast or over forecast? It's actually a big point of discussion right now for our commercial partners. For stat forecasts, we more focus on accuracy, but um, yeah, if you have the data and how we, we use a lot of Excel, my coworkers use a lot of Excel spreadsheets, these giant spreadsheets that, um, hey, it is what it is. So I work with that and open, open XLS, X, so that five times fast is a great package, but I can write that data in and we do track it. Um, and it's important because I think a lot of times people do get focused on accuracy. And then um, I actually seen that one of our one of our divisions and they they have a, they have this consistent bias, but they're like, well, we're accurate. We're only like 5% MAPE, you know, or weighted MAPE. It's like, we're great. Once like, well, there's some inventory building up there. Um, so yes, that is really important to do. And you should be able, if you have that very absolute variance, you might've created a variance um, field. So you could potentially use that and just calculate your bias at the same time. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all so much for joining. I just don't want anyone to feel like you have to stay around, but if you want to hang out with us all and maybe just chat informally, feel free to stay on. I just wanna say thank you so much to Ralph and Laura for your awesome presentations.